Church of Newton. I'm filling in for Pastor Todd today, who took a little break this week after whole, after all the uh, the festivities, so to speak, of Lent. Um, and today we will be joining the uh, the disciples who are locked in the upper room out of fear. So please let's join together in our call to worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Be glad in the Lord, sisters and brothers, and shout for joy, you children of God. We will rejoice and be glad in our Lord. And let us pray. God of grace and mercy, we want to continue singing the Alleluia's of Easter. But there are days when we just don't feel like singing. Sometimes we lock ourselves away fearful of what's happened or what the day may bring. Sometimes we allow our doubts to overwhelm our faith. Draw us back to you and to one another. Help us walk in your love and light that others may see in us the living, the loving and living presence of the risen Christ. Amen. And now rise in body or in spirit and join me in our opening song, Empty Grave. Thank you. 
You can see that
enter a time of prayer. We're called as Christians to pray unceasingly and to pray for each other. I'd like to lift up specific prayers and then invite you to add your own intentions. This morning, I pray for our church, for guidance, for hope, for direction. We'll need this even more strongly in the coming month. I pray for all those with health issues and experiencing physical pain. These things can overwhelm us and cause us to lose hope. Remove our doubt and bolster our faith as we struggle. I also pray for all those whose struggles are not visible, that they may find the courage to share those struggles with others and seek help. I personally lift up my daughter Rebecca, my son Aaron, and my four grandchildren. Hold them in the palm of your hand, Lord. And I invite you now to lift up any intentions, joys, or concerns that you might have. Traveling mercies for co workers. Traveling mercies for uh, Kevin Bender, who's going to be needing some major movement. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, today we learn about letting go of our doubt and fear to put our trust in you and you alone. When it comes to thing like, things like our health and personal safety, this task can seem to be difficult. Give us the strength and determination to find the peace that you gave us 2,000 years ago and that you continue to give every day of our lives. And now we pray the prayer our Savior taught us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind the locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound on his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. That 
Sunday evening. The disciples were meeting behind the locked doors because they were afraid. What Jesus did on that first Easter evening was to show those frightened disciples the same grace and mercy and forgiveness and love that he always showed. He came and stood among them and simply said, Peace be with you. And then to ease their doubts, he showed them his hands and his side. No wonder the disciples rejoiced to see him. Not only was Jesus alive and among them, he had also forgiven them for all that they had done and not done over those last dramatic days. We often read today's gospel and focus on Thomas, the doubting disciple who needed to put his finger in the marks of the nails before he would believe. But this story is really about all of those fear-filled disciples trembling behind that locked door and wondering what it all means. Doubt is nothing to be ashamed of. We're only human. Remember, Jesus is himself had doubt. When as he was dying on the cross, he cried out to God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This story is really about each and every one of us trying to live a life worthy of our Lord and Savior, struggling with doubt, weighed down with fear, and constantly falling short of what we know that he expects from us. Are we so different from those disciples, even after we heard so recently that Jesus is risen from the grave? I was saddened at the sparse attendance at our Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday services. But I appreciate all those who did attend. In my opinion, and it's a very humble one, these are two of the most important holy days of the year. Experiencing the last two days Jesus' life on this earth gives so much more clarity and significance to the empty tomb on Easter morning. We are an Easter people, but you can't understand the meaning of this joyful miracle without first experience, experiencing the betrayal, fear, and pain Jesus felt during those last two days. Thomas's unbelief is not in his request to see Jesus' wounds. He didn't ask to see more than the other disciples saw a week earlier. His unbelief, and theirs, is being stuck in the house with the doors locked. Belief in Jesus' resurrection is not a question of intellectual agreement. It's not about evidence or proof. It's not about getting the right answer. Belief is more about how we live than what we think. Resurrection is not just an event or an idea. It's a way of being and living. It's the lens through which we see the world, each other, and ourselves. Resurrection is the gift of God's life and love. Living resurrection, however, is difficult. For most of us, it's a process, something we, we grow into over time. It's neither quick nor magical. Resurrection does not undo our past, fix our problems, or change the circumstances of our lives. It changes us, offers a way through our problems, and creates a future. Christ's resurrected life inspires us with his spirit, invites us to unlock the doors, and sends us into the world. And this story is also about how Jesus comes to us in the midst of our doubts and fears and sin and guilt to offer each and every one of us that simple word of grace and mercy and forgiveness. Peace be with you. To us all. This gospel reading is really about the peace which surpasses all understanding. The peace which the world cannot give. The peace that can only come from our crucified and risen Lord, and the peace that comes when we most need it. Think back to a time in your life 
when you felt as though you had truly disappointed God. And now, imagine Jesus showing up at that very moment and saying to you, peace be with you. That is what our Lord does for us, uh, for each and every one of us. That too is what the miracle of peace means for us. But today's gospel reading is also about the ways in which we are called to share that peace and that joy with a world so filled with doubt and fear. Jesus didn't join his disciples in the upper room simply to celebrate his resurrection with them. He joined them there to give them the gift of the Holy Spirit and to send them out into the world to continue his mission. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Now the word apostle means one who is sent. The word disciple, on the other hand, means one who learns. The disciples have learned from Jesus many things. By his words and his example, he's taught them about the kingdom of God and about our Heavenly Father's purpose for them and to the world. Now these disciples are becoming disciples. Disciples who are sent into the world. Jesus sends those first disciples out into the world to be his apostles. And he sends us out into the world in the same way. We are all apostles. We are all part of the apostolic church. We are the sent out people of God with a mission that comes straight from our crucified and risen Messiah. But Jesus doesn't tell us to do this. He helps us to do this. That, too, is the miracle of the resurrection. After he said to the first apostles, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you, Jesus breathed on those apostles, giving the gift of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus breathed on them, I can almost imagine those disciples thinking back to the creation story in Genesis, when God took dust from the ground, formed Adam from the dust, and then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. As the Father did at the beginning, so the Son did to those first disciples. And so the Spirit does to us in our baptism. When we are made new creations in Christ, no longer merely dust which will be turned to dust when we die, we are now brothers and sisters in Christ who will live forever with our crucified and risen Lord. In our baptisms, we are given the new life of the risen Christ right away. This new life doesn't begin in heaven. It begins here on earth through the gift of the Holy Spirit, given to us in our baptisms. You see, it's not conquered death through the great triumph of Easter. Now he wants to breathe this new life into you and me. He wants to share that new life with us. And then... Then he wants us to go out and share that new life with others. To share that new life with a world that is suffocated by anxiety and fear. He wants to bring new life into this world through us. And our world needs that new life, doesn't it? And if we wonder where it will come from, it will come from us. We are the ones continuing Jesus' mission. We are now the body of Christ in the world. We are God's plan to bring new life into a dying world until the day that God's Son returns again. Our words, our deeds, our hope, our faith, our love, our witness in our daily lives, our acts of love to others, all of the, this is done in Jesus' name with the help of the Holy Spirit. All this is how the world catches a glimpse of our risen Lord. That is what, it, is what it means to be an apostle. And that is what we are. So that's what those first apostles did, right? They ran out and shared their joy with the world. Well, not exactly. Not right away. A week after the story starts, the first Sunday after Easter, we find those disciples back in the upper room. The door locked again. Has anything changed? 
Jesus shows up again, and this time he's upset, right? This time he's got to give him a pep talk and tell him to get out there and do what he asked, right? Well, no. The first thing he says when he shows up this time is, once again, he can give you. And he turns to Thomas. Now, as we've discussed, Thomas was not there a week ago when Jesus first appeared to the other disciples. We're not sure why. But I've always wondered if Thomas was the only one brave enough to leave the upper room to go and get some food for everyone. But at any rate, when the others told Thomas that they had seen the Lord, Thomas famously said, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. So what does Jesus do when he appears to Thomas? Again. Jesus showed patience and forgiveness and mercy. He said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. What patience Jesus has. Not only with Thomas, but with all the disciples. What patience he has with you and me. Again and again. In the midst of our doubts and fears, and in the midst of our sins and failings, our crucified and risen Lord and Savior comes to us and says, Peace be with you. Again and again, he comes to us and says, Do not doubt, but believe. Again and again, Jesus forgives us, breathes new life into us, and offers us the gift of new life in Christ and the promise of the Holy Spirit. And again and again, our risen Lord reminds us of our mission to go and share the peace and the joy and the hope of this new life with our world that struggles to find peace, joy, or hope. Again and again, the risen Lord comes to us to give us peace, to give us new life, to forgive our sins and to gently remind us not to doubt, but to believe. And again and again, he invites us to go. To go in peace to serve our Lord. Who among us has thought, please don't get my hopes up. I can't bear to be let down again. It's an all too familiar sentiment for many of us. We find ourselves so wounded that we can't face the possibility of something good for fear that is an empty promise. Our hearts reach a point of weariness, afraid to climb that tower of hope only for it to crumble under our feet. Remember, Thomas was absent on that Easter evening, so he still doesn't believe. He doesn't say he can't believe. Thomas says he will not believe, unless he touches Christ's wounds. He digs his heels in. He knew who he believed in and saw him crucified on a cross, nails through his hands and feet, and a spear driven into his side. All of Thomas's hopes and dreams, the culmination of a three-year journey, dashed to ruin in a matter of hours. He refuses to be crushed yet again. In the aftermath of a devastating loss, it can be difficult to find hope. So often during our tragedies, during our struggles and pain, we convince ourselves that God has abandoned us. How easily our faith is shaken. We don't see him, so we think he isn't there. How can he be here if things are this dark and chaotic? If he is here, does he even care? But in today's reading, Jesus steps into the pain of his reeling followers. Twice in his resurrected appearances, Jesus gives them what nothing in this world can give. Its inclusion here immediately calls to mind Jesus' promise a few chapters earlier. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. Because of Jesus, the 
the troubles and fear of this life put in their place. An interesting matter here, though, is how Jesus appears. When Jesus shows up in his resurrected body, why did he still have a trace of his wounds? For sure he could have been resurrected entirely without blemish. The apostles, Thomas included, knew that Jesus was crucified. They were with him the night he was beheaded. Some of them saw him hanging on the cross. They knew the wounds on his body, the nails through his hands and feet, and the spear wound in his side. The wounds are a powerful reminder that Jesus suffered greatly and died. And in these wounds, they can see themselves. And we see ourselves. We did this. We crucified him. But what they also show is that he is alive. This is the very Jesus they saw crucified. What we have here is not some ghost, some disembodied spirit, perhaps bearing the spectral resemblance of wounds. Ghosts were not a foreign concept in first century Palestine. They were just as much a part of cultural war as in our Western world. The apostles even thought Jesus was a ghost when he was seen walking on the Sea of Galilee. In Luke's account of Jesus' first resurrection appearance to the apostles, since they believe him to be a ghost, he even asks them for food and eats a piece of cooked fish to show his materiality. This body and these bones are real. This Jesus is flesh and bone and blood. Here is the glory. For it means these wounds which mark his death now mark the very defeat of death. At this point, I draw your attention to the screen. This is Caravaggio's painting, The Incredulity of St. Thomas, painted in 1601. It's a powerful image because in it, Jesus not only invites Thomas to touch him, but he guides Thomas's fingers into the wound in his side. However, as you see in today's scripture, Thomas never makes it near Christ's wounds. He doesn't need to. After the invocation of Jesus for Thomas to touch him, Thomas does the only thing he can do for the one who has conquered the grave. He falls to his knees and makes the first straightforward confession of Christ's divinity in all scripture my Lord and my God. Our doubting Thomas has lost all doubt. Thomas confesses that which the whole Gospel of John has pointed to. Jesus Christ is God himself. Jesus has stepped into his moment, his reality, and his came. Thomas must realize at that moment that Jesus has heard his anxiety and doubt even before showing himself. Jesus has been with him all along. At that moment, as Jesus stands before him, the thing that has seemed to be the surest defeat becomes the surest victory. The crucifixion of Christ becomes the vehicle of life. For Thomas and for us, the thing which was the loss of all hope and the creator of doubt becomes the way of Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. That same faith that was given to Thomas and the apostles, that of God made flesh in Jesus is the very faith we still confess to this day, 2,000 years later. I invite you now to use the screen and recite with me the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of saints, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. That we don't see Jesus physically standing before us and showing us his wounds as he did to Thomas and the other disciples. He presents himself to us. Jesus is alive. In the sacrament of communion, we receive Christ's body and blood that he gave in his death for the forgiveness of our sins. In the sacrament of baptism, we are raised to walk in Christ's resurrection life, which is now ours, sharing in his victory over death. In these signs, we receive his grace and promise. We receive a hope that overcomes all fear and faith. As we sang in our closing hymn on Easter Sunday, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. Let us pray. Risen Lord, the Easter season of Alleluia's can sometimes leave little room for our doubts and pain, but you will not be stopped by the locked doors we hide behind. You come right through them and wish us simply peace. We give thanks for all you have sacrificed for us. Let us be worthy of you and move out into the world proclaiming you without a doubt as our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Today we will not be having communion because I am not a person who can serve communion alone. So um, right now we will move on to our next song. All the people said, Amen. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit and sing join in the song.
seated for a moment before we do our benediction. I'd like to introduce Eddie Cornwell, who is the chair of our staff parish relations committee. Twice in the past two years, I have stood before you representing our SPRC, Staff Parish Relations Committee. Time, both of those times with a heavy heart. This morning, it is my joy to share with you that Bishop John R. Scholl has appointed the Reverend Dr. Vicki Brenberg as our new part-time interim pastor of our congregation. Reverend Vicki will begin her new responsibilities on July 1st of this year. As a United Methodist Church, we are part of an appointment system. Our congregation's Staff Parish Relations Committee has met with the district uh, superintendent to identify our congregation's needs and the need, our needed skills in a pastor. We have also met with Reverend Vicki to get better to her questions. Reverend Dr. Vicki Brenner is a retired elder residing in Stillwater, New Jersey, and worshiping in the, at the Blanchville, uh, New Jersey, United Methodist Church. During her 40 years in ministry, she faithfully served local churches in rural, urban, and suburban settings, and was also a district superintendent between 1996 and 2004. While she served as a PS, her pastoral and administrative leadership nurtured and empowered many pastors, laity, and churches. She is also a trained, intentional interim pastor. Vicki is married to Larry Brenberg, and they have four grown daughters and seven grandchildren. In retirement, Vicki enjoys gardening, traveling, reading, playing games on her iPad, and spending time with her family and friends. And there's more. Pastor Vicki will be partnering with a seminary student as part of our conference's Mosaic Ministries program. Our Staff Parish Relations Committee has also spoken with the seminarian Monica Lafaracizzi to better get to know her and to ask questions. Monica Mafarachisi was born in Zimbabwe. She is currently a Master of Divinity student at Drew Theological School in her third year. She earned her bachelor's degree from Rhodes University in South Africa. Monica was born and raised in the United Methodist Church. With over five years of experience in the finance and auditing field, Monica has developed a great deal of administration uh, of administrative skills, excuse me, and pays attention to details. Monica is the last child from a family of three. She enjoys the outdoors, meeting new people, and listening to music. Appointed as co-pastors, Vicki and Monica will combine their areas of expertise as a team, guiding our church forward through the upcoming year. We thank Pastor Todd for the love, dedication, and gifts with which his ministry has blessed our congregation. We are grateful for his enthusiasm, his knowledge and wisdom, as he has pastored us for the past seven years. Our new pastors will work with us and the conference so that we can continue to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Bishop Scholl and the leaders of the Greater New Jersey Conference will work with us to continue to grow as a vital congregation. I know that you will join the bishop, our new pastors, and me in helping to make new disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I'm going to be making the same announcement at the 1030 service, and as before, we ask you not to share this information with anyone until those worshipers have a chance to hear this announcement as well. Thank you. And now let's all get together for the benediction. I'm sorry, we don't have 
to memorize. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, may the love of God, the peace of the risen Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit fill your hearts now and always. Go forth to proclaim without a doubt the good news of our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Sunday school kids, that's exactly what we're talking about in Sunday school. Jesus wants us to go out and tell the world good news. Let's go back to the Thank you, Libby. I want to tell you what this is like, show you what this has to do with your.